Hi everybody! Today we're going to be answering some viewer questions, both from our channel as well as our Patreon and YouTube memberships. Now before we get started, if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. Your support really helps us out and we really kind of appreciate this feedback so that way we can go back and forth and kind of talk about the topics you guys want to talk about. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section down below or also on our Patreon and YouTube membership pages if you are a member. So let's get started. So the first question comes from Bryce Keeney, and he asks, follow through or snap techniques, which is better? I say both have their place and use. Bryce, I have to agree with you that they both have their place and their use. And as far as determining which one is better, really depends on that use that you or your intent, your, your intended result. Um, they've got very different applications. You know, snapping strikes are usually, you know, in terms of like jabs or quick snapping kicks, they're, they tend to be faster, but they don't have the power behind them as knockout shots would. Um, typically speaking, um, especially in the case of the jab, the jab tends to be the hand closest to the opponent, so it's closer, it's got less distance to travel, so it's a really good option to use, a good tool to use for a quick snap out strike, which may distract them or set the, your opponent up for that knockout shot. Now follow through techniques, would definitely be things along the lines of you're putting your whole body alignment into your striking weapon, whether it be a cross punch or a hit to the body or kick to the body. Basically, you're putting all your energy into your opponent. So the way I like to view it as snapping strikes or more setup strikes that set you up for those powerful knockout shots or the step through shots or the follow through shots. So it, like you said, it definitely depends on the, the time and place and the intent, the, the intended result that you would like to get from those strikes. Adam28171 asks, would you agree that Kempo is a percussion striking art and doesn't have the KO power strikes like boxing? Yes and no. Um, that's an excellent question. Actually, it's a very observant question. Uh, Kempo does have a lot of percussion striking in it. A lot of vibrating strikes, a lot of close range rebounding strikes. But I would not agree that it has that instead of knockout shots or follow through shots. Um, it's got, I would say it's pretty even balance of both. We do have a lot of strikes that you, you strike and recoil a lot of body strikes, a lot of body shots. And the way uh, we describe it as, I've heard it described as, it's kind of like a piano key. You go up to a piano, what's the difference between if you hit the piano key and you hold the key down? It just kind of goes, and it, holds, it holds the note. Versus you hit the key and you let go, that's when you get that rich vibrating sound. You're, allow, you're allowing the energy to recoil or reverb through the piano strings. Striking is very much a similar concept. So if you were to drive all of your body weight, all of your power into a strike, that energy's got nowhere else to go but reverberate inside of them. And I know I was at a seminar once with Jeff Speakman and he was explaining this concept and he was showing us a particular strike. It was like a downward hammer fist that you struck to the pelvis. And the way, the angle he was teaching it, the way he was describing it was, you wanted to hit in such a way that you've got that rotational power Power. You've got that dropping rotational power and you're doing your strike and you're reloading and that, that energy is going to reverberate around the inside of the pelvis and do a lot of bruising. And you can be skeptical of this, but we've seen him in class actually do strikes. He hit my instructor in a demonstration, hit him on one side of the body and the bruise showed up on the other side. So uh, there is a lot of focus on percussion because that could be a very devastating effect. I mean, you, if you really want to rebound an energy into a person's body, you can absolutely do so. As far as the knockout shots, absolutely, we have a bunch of driving shots, especially right to the body designed to crack ribs, uh, close-up elbow strikes. We do have driving, punching, cross strikes to the face. So I would say Kempo is an even mix of percussion strikes and follow-through or knockout penetrating strikes. It's got a mixture of both. And it's really just about knowing which one to use at which time. Speaking of Kempo, Spencer Ord asks, I'd love to hear more about the different methods of footwork within Kenpo Karate and if they differentiate from Shotokan, Kyokushin, Goju-ryu, Shito-ryu, and more about the methods of forward motion. This is an excellent question, Spencer, and I think um, we're going to have to circle around back to this one for a full in-depth topic because there's a lot that can be said about this. Uh, but for a quick summary, for a quick answer at this point in time, um, there's a lot of difference actually in Kenpo stances. And I like, to, I like to view Kempo not as just a karate system. I think it's its own category. You've got karate, you've got kung fu, you've got jiu-jitsu, and you also have Kempo. These are categories. And there's a lot of overlap, but Kempo stances do differentiate 
while they look similar in some aspects, have a lot of differences from your standard, standard karate stances. One being they're typically not as deep as the Japanese stances. You won't usually see a lot of Kempoas go super deep into their stances. If you do, or if they are, uh, there's either a reason for it, they're trying to demonstrate something, or it's for, uh, for a tournament, or they're performing it incorrectly. But our stances are not meant to go super, super deep. Just to give you a really quick rundown of the stances that we do have in Kempo, these are our standard common stances. So first we have the horse stance, and this is used for isolation and training for the most part. It does show up in some certain techniques, but basically what we do is when we go into our horse stance, we are locking our lower half of our body so we can focus on the upper half of the body, whether it be a striking set or a blocking set or any number of different ideas. But basically we are not worried about the lower half of the body, but we're not just standing there casually. We're locking it out into a solid solidified base so that we can focus on the upper half of our body. Um, it will show up as a transitional stance and certain techniques, but for the most part, it is a training stance. Our neutral bow stance is our default fighting stance. Basically, weight distribution is 50% of the weight on the front leg, 50% on the rear leg. Now, this stance is not dissimilar from a karate fighting stance, but one of the key differences is, or one of the more notable differences, is that we try to close off our center line by bending that front leg, kind of blocking an entry for groin strikes. Um, it might seem like a small detail, but believe it or not, I've actually had it come in handy quite a few times in sparring. So that was that is our default stance, but that is, you know, from that position we could throw just about every technique every strike every block that we have in our arsenal that is just our natural neutral fighting stance and then we come to the forward bow stance this is probably one of the more common striking stances the forward bow basically um, is used for rotational power and it's got a weight distribution of 60 percent of our weight on the front leg and 40 percent on our rear leg so we're kind of leaning into it very very similar to a karate front stance or a zenkutsudachi stance uh, the purpose that we have it is for really three main reasons. The first one is that rotational power, that rotational twist gives us power for our rear hand strikes. So as we mentioned earlier, front hands are usually used to apply jabs because they're quick and they're snappy when we set up for that rear hand. But for that rear hand power, you want to put your hips into it, that rotation. So the four of those hands gives us that transition into that rotation. And when you settle into it the same time as you strike, there's a lot of power that can be administered through that stance. The other two reasons that we do that is, besides power, is um, actually neutralizes our reach. Because if you notice, if I were to stand in my neutral bow stance, my general fighting stance, my front hand has more reach or closer reach to the opponent than my rear hand. I cannot reach with my rear hand um, at the same distance until I do that rotation. So that also gives me that reach. And the third reason is a bracing angle. A properly applied forward bow stance with the heel planted can actually sustain quite a bit of mo uh, resistance and being pushed back and you're not going to stand there in the fight and do this so it's, it's usually a quick a quick transitional strike and go back but if you want to practice just how strong the stance can be go to the ocean go to the beach stand in the ocean as the waves hit you and stand in your front in your um forward bow stance and just kind of regain your balance and see how well you can fight against those waves it's actually a really really powerful bracing angle when applied in the right applications we also have the reverse bow, which is basically our forward bow, but we're looking over the other shoulder. It also has the same 60-40 weight distribution, but it's just reversed. And this stance comes into quite uh, a, a bit of use when we're doing like lower strikes, if we're going to strike to the groin, or for those who are familiar with Kempo and have seen Kempo, we have that buckle, that leg buckle. It's a very distinctive Kempo technique. That leg buckle, when done properly, is a nicely done forward bow stance that can buckle and pop out your, your opponent's rear leg and sets them up for other strikes. It's a very, very useful stance, again, when applied in the right scenarios. Then we have two stances that lower our body height, the wide kneel stance and the closed kneel stance. And real quick, basically, the reason we have two of them is they serve two different purposes. The wide kneel stance is basically our neutral bow. So if you take our fighting position and just bend your knees and drop your height. So for whatever reason, you, you need to drop your height and deliver a forward strike or, or you're doing a groin strike, whatever, but you're just bringing your stance down. That is the wide kneel stance. So if the wide kneel stance is basically our neutral bow just lowered onto a lower plane, the closing heel stance is our forward bow doing the same thing. And this is used typically when we're doing like a downward strike. So say we've got our opponent on the ground and we want to sit, we want to drop down and deliver, you know, a nice punch to the face or, or a strike to the body. This stance by, by bending that rear leg and driving downward actually aligns our body with our weapon and it gives us that bracing angle on a downward path. And in addition to that though, is especially if you're striking an opponent on the ground, that knee is really good as a check or even dropping down low to apply pressure on the ribs or on the body or whatever you want them to do. So two different stances used to lower heights with slightly different purposes. So the neutral bow stance basically lowered is our wide, is our wide kneel stance and our forward bow lowered is our closed kneel stance. 
Well, we have a bunch of other stances. We've got the cast stance, we have the twist stance, we have the crane stance, and they've got specialized applications. Um, I don't want to get into too much right now because, like I said, we could do a whole episode on stances. Uh, we do have the back stance or rear bow, but it's only in one technique as far as I'm aware of. It's not common at all in Kempo. You see it a lot in traditional karate. We don't have it very much in Kempo. It's there, I think, basically just to kind of complete the existence of the different types of stances. Um, but you won't see it too often. But we do have a lot of stances in Kempo that are pretty distinct to Kempo. Sometimes they look like karate stances, sometimes they look like Chinese martial arts stances, but they definitely have their own flavor. Now, as far as the forward motion that you're talking about, our movement, we do have several foot maneuvers that will allow us to advance or retreat because one of our big focuses is on gaining and decreasing distance. So if we want to get closer to the opponent or we want to get back from the opponent for whatever reason, we've got maneuvers for that, foot maneuvers. And the basic foot maneuvers are we have our crossovers. So if you just kind of want to keep your guard up, you want to advance forward, but you would keep your center line protected. We do crossovers. You can do step throughs, which is also advancing. You see these a lot in our freestyle sparring techniques. Uh, we also have twist stances and we've got shuffles and we've got different methods of, you know, taking a step and dragging up or dragging and stepping, different timings of that. So basically the general rule with our foot maneuvers is you put them wherever you need them. So you have to gauge on the spot your distance from your opponent and whether you want to close the gap or you want to increase the distance, that's going to determine which foot maneuvers you use. But we definitely do have maneuvers that drive forward and also retreat. And like I said, you'll see a lot of these in our uh, Kempo Freestyle techniques. Next question is from Tom Tom. He says, hey Daniel, would you consider letting your subscribers choose the next martial art you learn? This is a very thoughtful and excellent question. It's kind of a cool idea, but the answer is a hard no. And not because I don't want you guys, you know, involved in my training. The reason is um, the, the material I'm looking for is very specialized for my own personal needs and everyone's needs is gonna be different. So whatever art you know you choose, or he chooses, or she chooses, or I choose, they're gonna be different because we're looking for different things. In my case, my background is Kempo. So I'm gonna look at my own training and see what the pluses and minuses are, where I feel the advantages are, and then I'm gonna look for arts that kind of fill in the gaps and the disadvantages. So for example, that's why I started training in Jiu Jitsu and Judo. So I wanted to learn stand-up grappling and throws and more joint submissions and, and blend that into my Kempo training. And uh, we also did a little bit of BJJ years back. So without really knowing my background, what my goals are, it'd be hard for you guys to choose arts for me, just as it'd be hard for me just to say, hey, Tom, Tom, you know, why don't you go do X, Y, Z? I don't know your goals. I don't know your background or your current experience. So no, I'm not really considering letting people choose for me, but I am happy to share and I am planning uh, more arts to get into. And I definitely want to share that journey and ask for feedback and demonstrate it and just kind of explore the whole world of cross training. And, and that brings us to the next question. And I really, sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, I know you're a regular on our channel, but this question comes from Camilo Iribaran. I really hope I pronounced that correctly. And he asks, what is one style of martial art that you would like to practice, but you haven't gotten a chance to yet? Excellent, excellent question. And I actually have a few. Um, I'm interested in learning a little bit of Japanese karate. I've explored just a little bit. Um, I've looked in the Shotokan a little bit. I haven't formally trained anything yet, but I kind of want to go that route just for a little bit of taste of cultural tradition. I would like to see a traditional Japanese martial art or Okinawan martial art. Um, Muay Thai has got some great strikes. We did a little bit of some Muay Thai striking when my, when my instructor taught MMA. Uh, but if I had to choose right now an art to jump into, honestly, it'd probably be something as simple as boxing. Um, we did, we did, we've done a little bit in class, but I think it would be valuable to do just a boxing training for, for a little bit. Go do a stretch just to build mechanics, just to work on timing and get more powerful strikes. I think boxing is one of the most powerful striking arts that's out there. And I believe that that can only enhance training. So if I were to go choose a specific um, discipline to get into right now, it probably would be boxing if I was going to devote any amount of time to it and then take that and blend that in with my other material that I've already learned. David Burns asks, I'd love to see you cover Shorin Ryu, which is the modern name of Shurite Karate. This one's interesting, and yes, I'm actually very interested in Shorin Ryu. Um, it is a very old, old karate system. It's one of the earliest ones. You know, Shurite uh, is one of the three primary Okinawa systems that arrived, uh, that arose from different training in the villages of Okinawa. There were the three, the three main villages, Shuri, Tomari, and Naha, and you've got the different branches of martial arts that came from that, and of course, those branched off to other arts. Shurite, um, it's got a root in a lot of different arts because it's it's, um, in Shorinru. Shorinru is one of the base arts to Shotokan, which one of the base arts to many other arts out there. So you could pretty 
pretty much expand out quite a bit of generations and still find a way to trace back to Shurite. So that's that really interests me. Um, we haven't done a history episode yet. I would like to at some point. Uh, we're producing a bunch of YouTube shorts that we're going to touch on it real quick for a YouTube short. Um, but for, for now, um, for those of you who have not seen it, we did an interview with Sensei William Christopher Ford. That is his art. We talked about it a little bit, just a little bit of the training aspect of it. So if you have not seen that episode, I, I highly recommend go checking it out. He's got an awesome, awesome channel. He's got some great content. But Shoran Ryu is definitely an art I would like to come back to and explore further if that's something that enough people have interest in. And the last question is from Lionel Bishop. Instead of what martial art is most powerful, which martial art is most changed or affected since the debut of the UFC? Which martial art has evolved the most? Wow, this is a great question. And uh, it's kind of hard to answer quickly, but which martial art has changed the most? Um, I'm gonna have to say probably, the answer is a little bit twofold. One, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, because that was the world stage of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's when, I mean, it was around before that, but that's when everybody really got to see it. And I think as an art, that was an explosive point and it proliferated. So I think the art really changed in terms of its popularity and its focus. And now you've got different, it's starting to branch off with its own, its own evolutions and its own schools. So I think definitely that saw a growth and boost. Um, I think a lot of traditional systems um, had to update to, to address it because, you know, ground fighting is, you could say the second half of fighting. And a lot of Okinawan karate systems, they, they had some of this already in there. They had some of the grappling that was removed later on. So you either see systems bringing it back in, or you see a lot of schools, a lot of traditional schools now adding grappling and MMA classes or, or grappling and BJJ classes into the curriculum to kind of address that. Kempo definitely did it with Jeff Speakman's Kempo 5.0. If you have not seen that episode, we did an interview with Mr. Speakman. I definitely highly recommend that one. He's got a lot to say about the topic and why that need was there. So to answer the question, I think a lot of traditional arts in general had to change and evolve to address BJJ and address the new MMA trend because it popularized it and it kind of showed that, hey, this is a style that's, it's you know, we shouldn't neglect the ground fighting, it's here. But if I had to pick a martial art that evolved the most, Honestly, I'm gonna kind of just kind of go outside the box a little bit and say MMA. Now, MMA is not an art; is you know, it's mixed martial arts. But I do think we're starting to see a flavor of mixed martial arts, specifically because of the UFC, a particular blend. I mean, most fighters have some sort of grappling, striking uh, arts in there, and it's usually BJJ, Muay Thai, boxing, some Taekwondo, karate. We're starting to see same mixes. And while there's other fl flavors thrown in, there's still the core that we're seeing in the UFC. So I, I believe that over time, we're gonna see that, that mixture start to congeal into a core core curriculum. It's already, started, it already is starting to do that. And I believe we're going to see that eventually tighten up and become its own system. I think UFC style MMA will eventually become its own martial arts system. Even though there's a bunch of arts out there that are MMA because they're mixes and they're hybrids, I think we're gonna see this continue to evolve and go in direction to become its own thing. So because of the UFC, I think the UFC will be an art that evolved the most. So that's just kind of like my observation thinking off the top of my head with this one. So thank you to everybody who sent in questions. I really love that people are asking these because it makes us think, it makes everybody think, and it provides a lot of good talking points. We really love interacting with all of you and we cannot wait to bring more content to you in the horizon. We've got a lot more coming, so stay tuned. And be sure to check out our episode with William Christopher Ford who talks about his shore and rear training and a little bit about the Karate Kid lore because he did play Dennis in Karate Kid Part 3. So if you're interested in that, please go watch that interview. He's such a great guy. I highly recommend his channel. And thank you all for, for watching and we will see you next time.